Hey, it's Arrow. PodFest brings together three different conversations from musicians to authors, doctors, environmentalists, or cooks in their own kitchen. It's real people with real stories. PodFest 43 features a Big Bang Theory, an animal rescuer, and a top chef in their own kitchen. Up first is Kanal Nayar, who played the fun-loving Raj on Big Bang Theory. We can never stop talking about guest number two. What Chrissy Newman and her NASCAR husband are doing with Pet Rescue should be an everyday conversation. And then we're going to wrap things up with an amazing down-to-earth conversation with someone who is globally known, the amazing Chris Jenner. This is PodFest 43. Okay, here's the deal. Six months ago, my research testing the predicted composition of trans-Neptunian objects ran into a dead end. So? So, my visa's only good as long as I'm employed at the university, and when they find out I've got squat, they're going to cut me off. By the way, when I say squat, I mean diddly squat. <laughs> hey, it's Arrow on iHeartRadio, unplugged and totally uncut with actor Kanal Nayar. I've reconsidered your offer to let me work with you. For me. <laughs> yes, for you. I do, however, have a few conditions. First, at all times, I'm to be treated as a colleague and an equal. Second, my contributions shall be noted in all published materials. And third, you are never allowed to lecture me on Hinduism or my Indian culture. I'm impressed, Raj. Those are very cogent and reasonable conditions. Thank you. I reject them all. (laughs) Then you leave me no choice. I accept the job. Good morning, Kanal. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Arrow. How are you? Doing very well. You have got to be the most mysterious man in Hollywood. (laughs) Why? Because we don't know that much about you until now. Oh, yes, exactly. That's the point of writing the book. Yes, my accent is real. And and what a book it is. It is a path. It is, I mean, I love your dad's comments. My God. You you, you have to just laugh at, at some of the things your dad has said to you. Yeah, I, sometimes you laugh and sometimes you take them seriously. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing the wisdom that he really imbued on me was incredible. Did he help you with your badminton game at all? No, he didn't. <laughs> it's funny, though. My badminton game. It, that's why I wrote a chapter about it, because when I tell people in America that I played badminton growing up, they like laugh at me. And I'm like, this is a serious sport, you know? So that'd be like taking cornhole over there to, to your country going, what is this? It's beanbags. Exactly. Is, uh, yeah, that, I didn't even know that's a sport. Yeah. They, well, maybe it's just something we do down here in the South where we just throw beanbags into a hole. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Give me a beanbag and a hole and I bet you I'll be the most competitive person on, 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 the, on the garden. What do you play it on? On the sand? On yeah, the, you do it in the sands. You do it at NASCAR races. You do it wherever there's a party. All right, I'm in. <laughs> do, you, do you find that, that maybe it's time to put badminton in the Olympics or even the X Games? I think there are. Olymp- I think it is a thing. Badminton is in the Olympics. That's right, because they hit it so hard. I do remember that. Yeah, you should YouTube it after this interview. It's really fascinating to watch. But how do you watch that? Now, you've played badminton, and I, and I know what my bad backyard badminton is like. I, yeah. it, it's like a, a feather floating out of the sky. You, you, but you're competitive, so I'll bet you you're really whapping that thing. Yeah, uh, wh- yeah, I am whapping it. It's called a shuttlecock. <laughs> I tell you about cornhole, you tell me about the shuttlecock. I mean, it's yeah, just... <laughs> no, hey, no, we're sharing information. Being on. <laughs> You're allowing yourself to be put out there now to where people are going to get the opportunity to really get to know you. Is that fun for you to do that, or is it a challenge so that people can start saying, my God, this guy is real? It's scary, to be honest. Uh, I struggled... You know, finishing the book, I struggled writing the book. I str- for two years, I, I almost put it off till the last second. I couldn't write it. I, you know, I was really nervous about it. And then I, and then I said, you know, this it's better for me to put it out like this, my story, as opposed to someone finding out something about me and putting it in TMZ or something. You know, I was like, let me just tell my story. It's a pretty interesting story from, especially the stuff in New Delhi, growing up in India, uh, the journey from New Delhi to Los Angeles, and all of the sort of heartbreak and triumph and then failure and then the ultimate triumph. And I think that may, hopefully it'll inspire people to, you know, younger people to live out their dreams. They always say that through frustration, greatness grows, and, and you are definitely proof of that. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Now, in waiting for this book, because we've been waiting for it too, mm-hmm. you being the writer, did you mm-hmm. sit there behind the computer going, I can't do this, but then you challenged yourself to do it in a way where there's little scenes that you kept going back to? I think that the the thing that kept me going really was my my publishing company because they really believed in me and and 
you know, p- part of my hesitation to write the book was it's just scary to put your life out there. I try to live such a private life. It's just scary to talk about the time you failed or the time this happened to you or the time that happened to you. It really, that was the big challenge. And then I kept thinking about how I was inspired continuously by reading people's stories. And then I said, let's just keep going and see what happens. And that journey actually began in London. Yeah, I was born and I only lived there for four years. Uh, moved uh, from I was born there and then I moved to New Delhi when I was four years old. And so I wrote a chapter about London and it, it was like ten sentences. So when you, when you went to New Delhi, did they go, man, what are you doing here with your British accent? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, can I have a glass of water? <laughs> That's how all British people sound to me in my head. <laughs> in all the places that you've traveled, is there any place colder than mint gum and ice cold water? No. That's, do, do, do you agree with me, though? How, how can do. people do that? <laughs> that is such a, a... But it happens all the time, though. That's like sticking your tongue on a, on a frozen pipe. Yeah, I could never do it. I, it's, it's the most disgusting thing in the, in the universe. Oh, I, oh, you know what's the grossest thing I ever saw? Someone, I should have written this in a book. I, I saw uh, there was a father and a son, and they were eating chicken wings... And drinking hot chocolate. Oh, God. That's pretty disgusting. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, right, right? Yeah. Your life is like a mountain that is becoming sand on a beach, meaning basically that it is a continuation of several journeys. Yes. Um, it is. It, you know, it, it, I, I don't know that metaphor, although I like it. Um, I, it is. It's, it's just a melting pot. You know, I think the world is getting smaller and I'm like a proof of that, that I could be this kid from a completely different culture, completely different country and come to America and, and live out this great dream. In a really weird way, do you look at yourself as being a millennial pioneer where Ricky Ricardo and Bruce Lee also became very popular because they broke the rules? Wow, I don't, it's very difficult for me to look at myself like that. You know, I'm just this kid living this dream, to be honest. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm paving the way or if I'm a millennial. I, I just think the, 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 less, uh, the less labels you put in yourself, the more you can achieve. On Big Bang Theory, when, when they would bring in your parents, was, yeah. was, was, that, was that written from your personal life? Did they ask you questions and things? I think the writers continuously ask me questions about India because I did live that experience. So they'll ask me questions about, hey, what would your parents do? Or, you know, what would the apartment look like in India? Or what do you eat when you go to the bowling alley? Or what's a fun, you know, what, what is a, a religious festival that's close to Christmas in India? So the writers are, are so, they're so smart and they've written this character such like not a stereotype of India like this guy you know Raj doesn't like India and he doesn't like Indian food and he he's he loves eating burgers and beef and I really love the way they've crafted this character in such reality the way that you have brought that character to life it's like you're our best friend are you that way in real life too I like to really, yeah, I think I'd like to believe that. I like to believe I'm a good friend and I'm a very open, open guy. I'm a very open minded guy. I'm a very open hearted guy. But I have to be honest, sometimes, you know, with the with the popularity of the show and the fame of the show, you can become a target. So I'm constantly juggling with like, hey, can I just be this person's best friend because I really like them? Oh, wait, do they want something from me? This this book, all the way through it while I was reading it, I kept thinking he's setting himself up to write movies, to create sitcoms. That that being on the on, on Big Bang Theory now is just the beginning of, of greatness. That's very kind of you to say. Yeah, I think that the Big Bang has been such a wonderful and continues to be such a wonderful platform that hopefully in the future I don't have to sit around waiting for the phone to ring. I can hopefully create my own content. Would you call yourself? <laughs> I do every night, my friend. <laughs> so with, with, with your openness and awareness of what's going on, do you find that maybe sometime in your life you'll be like Cal Penn and become a little bit more actively involved in Washington, D.C. to make those connections with India and stuff? You know, uh, Cal is such a wonderful, smart guy. Uh, I think that he is much smarter than me. Uh, I use whatever fame I can in, in, in charity in India and, and charity in America. And uh, I think that's the extent of, of what I do is, you know, we have a lot of scholarships at Temple University and University of Portland. And we do, we support a lot of charities in India and uh, charities in Los Angeles. The political stuff is... It's just something that I haven't, I haven't gotten into yet. I, I, but I think that's next on the list. I wish there was just a way that we could all learn more about people from India. Because, I, and I'll tell you how I got closer by studying Hinduism. Oh yeah, it's, it, it's such a peaceful walk through life. 
I think all religion is a peaceful walk through life. I think it's the idiot human beings who interpret it and decide they can do whatever they want to and and you know with with the words that are written. Um but yeah, you know, it's it's nice to be part of a religion that believes in many gods. Mhm. Rule number 1 you say and I I'd like to know what book this came from. Men should use the word adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I just think the more harmless you are, the easier it is to pick up women. <laughs> But yes. then they find out the real. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. I you love can edit that part out. <laughs> I love the idea that you scribble on on napkins and stuff. It's almost like there's an inner rock star in you. Oh man, that's so I've no one's ever said that to me. I'm just going to like I don't need therapy anymore. I'm just going to call you and chat with you all the time. <laughs> inner rock star. I'm going to write that on a napkin. Because I mean, with with your imagination, these thoughts have got to be coming at you a thousand miles a minute and if you don't write them down, you know that by the time you get to the car, you forgot it. You know, I had to actually the the original aeroplane thoughts, I had like six or seven of them on each napkin and then I decided to just put one because I was like this is just too weird I just got to put some of the ones that people will connect with and then what do you do you like you just put them in your pocket and wait till you get home yeah I, I do that or now I have an iPhone but before iPhones I would write them down now I just put everything in my notes See, you are a writer. There is that in you. You're going to be doing movies, dude. Maybe uh, any Bollywood movies that you'd write, or w- would you pretty much keep it Americanized? No, I, I'd love to do a movie. I'd love to do a movie in speaking in Hindi in India. That would be universal, you know? See, that, you are the connection. <laughs> I, and, and, you know, and do you think do you think that's because it, you come from roots such as your father where he says, treat a king and a beggar the same? I think that uh, yeah I think that if you can stay humble and put your head down and work hard I think you can achieve anything you know I think when you get it's when you start thinking you're some great thing is that gets in the way I think you ev- everyone has some you know every single person can can do something great so just just live your life and wow, no, I just I'm a Hallmark card today. I'm a Hallmark. <laughs> what am I? Just live your life. Oh my God! I'm like quoting Ti rapper. <laughs> Thirteen things that you've learned from from playing an astrophysicist on TV. But my question would be, what have you learned today by being on this radio tour from all these wacky Americans talking to you? <laughs> I've learned that I really do love radio and I think that radio has been a big part of my life and I love chatting with people. I think it's been really wonderful. This tour has been wonderful. Now I want to talk to the writer this time and the writer meaning that as as you've written this book and you put it down and you had to go through your first editing and then your 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 publishing company came at you there there was still that element where you had to say goodbye to the book and relinquish it. What was that moment like for you to be able to make that transition? You know, it didn't feel like goodbye until literally last week. And I didn't even say goodbye because I was still editing. I mean, literally, like, you're still, even till a week before the book is getting published, you're thinking about things and you're like, oh, that word should change. And I'm, I got the book in my hand and that was the first time it felt real. And that's the first time I got a little emotional because it had been such a long journey to put it together. And I looked at it and it was real and it was in my hand. And I'm reading it right now myself. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I should maybe, you know. There's not a lot, but there's, there's, it's never going to be exactly the way you imagined it. But this is probably probably the closest it's ever going to be. And that, and that's one thing that readers don't understand sometimes that when you write a book that when the writer goes back they they're in a different mind form and and there is a connection between those words. 100%, especially because it's my story about my journey. It's not fiction. You know, that's why this was more difficult to write. I can write a thousand stories, but writing about yourself is the hardest thing to do. But yet you speak so well about yourself and that, and that, that but you're very humble too. Yeah, but then sometimes I look at it and I'm like, oh man, I'm so narcissistic. Oh my God, is that really what that sounds like? I'm such an ass. You know, I, and then look, people I hope are going to love the book and then there's always going to be people who don't like it and that's the social media. You know, on Twitter, you'll get a hundred people saying, oh, they love the book and one person is like, oh, you're an idiot, go back to your country. And then that's, your day is ruined. You know, your day is like just ruined. <laughs> are you guys getting set up for the new season? We started three weeks ago. We started season nine, yeah. It's that show and, and you being a part of that show, it, it's become such a dynasty on CBS. As you grow forward as an actor, what would be the first thing that you would go toward? I think it'd be fun to do a drama after this. I think it'd be fun to do a show like 
House of Cards or something like that, completely different than what I've been doing uh, for the last, you know, 10, 11 years because I, I believe in my talent, I believe in my training and I believe it'll be fun to, uh, to stretch it or just, you know, do theatre or something. I just did a play this summer off-Broadway with Jesse Eisenberg called The Spoils and that was a great experience, so maybe I'll do that again. Wait, you were with, with Jesse, but you also had your friend who, who you said could be a, a Zuckerberg. That's, that's a connection right there. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know that it was going to come full circle again. It, 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 little, little things like that in your life, it's what is, is what's so inspiring because at any given moment, you could have stepped off the path and stayed back there in India, but you did not. You kept moving forward. Where, where is that coming from? I think I've just had an affinity toward living life. Uh, and I, by the way, I enjoyed, even in the heartbreak, I enjoyed it. There was something sort of masochistic about all of the heartbreak that happened along the way. Um, I, I wore, you have to wear life on your sleeve lightly. You have to. Otherwise, you're just always going to get in your own way. That's a positive thought. Wow, ever, I'm all, I'm uh, really uh, all marking it up today. <laughs> Where life lightly on your sleeve? I mean, are, we, are you writing this stuff down? This is going to be my next book. <laughs> your, your chapter about how it's not a laugh track. It's what what makes you laugh if if you're not hearing it inside your head. What makes me laugh? Humanity. Humanity makes me laugh. Like when someone is walking confidently and slightly trips on something and then they look around to see if anyone noticed. Like I think that's the most funny thing. Or when people silently fart and pretend like they just haven't but you can see it on their face. Like humanity I think is so funny and interesting because we take ourselves so seriously but at heart we're all just big kids. (laughs) Do you find yourself like at a Starbucks just sitting there just watching people behind sunglasses? Oh, all the time. I just love, like, or like when I do something stupid, you know, like I'll just say something like, I remember I was, I was at a, I was at Emmy, I was at an Emmy party and Chris, I'm a huge basketball fan and Chris Bosch was the player for the Miami Heat and, and I was like, oh my God, it's Chris Bosch, what do I say to him? And then my wife like pushed me basically into him and said, just talk to him. And I was like, hey Chris, man, how's it going, man? Like, cool to see you. Wow. Like you're so tall in person, you, you know, how's oh, the NBA is happening? This was during the, the, the strike, you know, oh, you guys are striking. Striking right now, man. I, I love labor. You know, labor is so important in the country. I don't know what I was saying. And I was like, what am I saying? I kept saying in my head, I kept saying, stop talking to him. Stop talking to him. He was like, yeah, man. Yeah, you know. And he was, and that's probably how people, sometimes people come up to, that's why I'm so sensitive when people come up to me and say something stupid. They're like, oh, like people say to me all the time, oh, I'm a girl. You're talking to me right now. And then my only response is, yeah, I'm drunk. But I understand what it feels like to be a mumbling idiot. So I, I find those things are really hilarious, you when, know, when I do something stupid. When they broke you out of that shell on Big Bang Theory where you could finally start talking to girls. Did, did, was that a comfortable moment for you? I loved it. I think that it was it was both freeing for the writers and for me because I would be in these big scenes where the girls were and I couldn't speak and I'd have to whisper and they'd have to write around that. So I think it was great for both of us. And now you've fallen in love on the show so it's like, oh my God. Yeah, I've fallen in love with a girl who wants to have sex on a graveyard. I mean, <laughs> of course. I mean, with the, one time Raj meets a beautiful woman that he's going to date and she turns out to be this really scary person who loves like dark, dingy things. <laughs> I, I would love to be a part of those those table talks where they first introduce the scripts for each week, and you guys have to sit there and discuss those things before it goes into editing. Yeah, you know, we don't we don't even get to discuss them. We just get the scripts. We tape on a Tuesday night in front of a live audience. After the taping, we get the ne- script for the next day, and it's like Christmas morning. Literally, opening every script is like Christmas because the writers are so incredible. Your heart is so open that you, you're not afraid to talk about that there is a difference between TV fame and movie fame. Yeah, there is a big difference. I think if you're in someone's television every single day, they feel like they know you, they're familiar with you, they feel like you're their family, they're very touchy and grabby. And, uh, you know, and then if you first, like if someone wants to take a picture and I'm meeting with my family or something and I'm like, not right now, there's, they get really upset too because they're like, wait a second, you're like Raj and now you're being the super famous guy. Like the people get very into your face because you're in their living room every single day. Whereas as opposed to a movie star, there's this aura about you and people kind of stay back away from you you know there's a great story Jennifer Aniston talks about this all the time when she was on Friends and married to Brad Pitt people would come up to her but never talk to Brad Pitt on the street but they would always come and mob her and take pictures of her but they would never take pictures of Brad Pitt because they're very intimidated by him how do you feel about that for your own personal life as you continue to grow forward you know I'm Jennifer Aniston, you know, and that's how I feel. Like, I, I wish I was the Brad Pitt, but I'm the Jennifer Aniston of television. Oh, my God. Do, do, do you fear at any time that you could be typecast into the character of Raj? 
Um, I think that breaking the mold, you know, is something that all actors wish they could do, play anything, any character at any time, because that's what we believe we can do. Uh, but no, I, I think... I, th- I believe in my talent. I believe that I'll be able to do anything and that this show has been such a wonderful platform, you know, stereotyping or not or what people talk about, that kind of stuff. I don't get into those conversations because if it wasn't for this show, I wouldn't be here talking to you. If it wasn't for this show, I wouldn't be able to get my next job or whatever's next after this. So you do believe in that continuation then? 100%. Without this, where would I be? And and, and that's what I love so much about Hinduism and in India because it, it is about family. It is about celebration. And and even on the holidays when you have to visit all your cousins, you, you got through that okay, right? I have so many cousins, man. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I literally, any city in the world, I'll have a cousin. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't, and I think people are faking it now. Like, literally, I'll get an email like, I'm your 17th cousin from New Zealand. And I'm like, you just got my email address from someone and now, and you're just my cousin. <laughs> Do you ever thought about marketing your character, Raj? Getting, a, you know, like a little Barbie doll or some sort of doll and getting it? You know, it. we have Lego. We, we, have, we have dolls and Lego. Now we're like a Lego. There's That's a full, like, Big Bang awesome. Theory set Lego. See, you came to America to become a Lego. That's awesome, dude. That is literally my biggest thing I checked off my bucket list. And, and like, it's Raj. It's a Raj Lego figurine, and he's got a little cinnamon <laughs> attached to him. Like, his little dog is attached to him. It's beautiful. <laughs> what part of the book did not make it to the book? What What is still sitting inside that computer that it, it just you just felt like it wasn't time? There was a chat. There was a period in my life that I don't really talk about much. Is after I got the job on Big Bang Theory before I met my current wife. There's there was a period in my life that I didn't really want to talk about the fame and all of that stuff that came with it. That's not part of the book. I didn't want to. You know, people probably want to think my life was like entourage. You know, when I got the show and stuff, but it wasn't. And there was nothing. You know, I, I struggled actually writing the chapter about meeting my wife because that's such a personal thing. I liked, I liked writing the story about the wedding because it was seven days, a thousand people, and that's yeah. fun. But the chapter of actually meeting my wife, I, I struggled with and I'm still not in love with it. You know, it's not the best chapter in the book. Don't tell anyone. But it is what it is. And I think people want to know how the hell I married a beauty queen, how I married a former Miss India. So that's why I put it in there. And, and your heart just knew it was in the right place. I think so. I mean, it, how do you ever know, right? Uh, relationships are up and down in the tough, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's as close to good as it gets. I always believe that one of the real reasons why I got into radio was because I was going to do everything humanly possible to just rescue animals. Every show, you would always hear me say, keep smiling and keep loving those pets. And the reason why was because I wanted people to ask me about why do you say that? And it gave me an opportunity to step into their lives and say, what are you doing to help rescue animals? What are you doing to help bring out the importance of animals in our lives? As a growing nation, we need to take care of everything that is America, and that includes animals. We are unplugged and totally uncut with somebody that truly goes above and beyond. Chrissy Newman, the executive director of Rescue Ranch, an animal welfare organization dedicated to humane education, enhancing the human animal bond, compassionate rescue and responsible adoption in an effort to end pet overpopulation and its associated sufferings. They're located in Statesville, North Carolina on 87 acres. Hi, this is Chrissy Newman. To have such a big heart. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, when they say, do dogs go to heaven? I I think Mm -hmm. that it starts here first with, with people like yourself. Well, thank you. And where where do you get the love in your heart, or where did it come from for you guys to say, let's let's open up our lives to do this? I think uh, we both had it as young kids growing up around animals, and then um, I don't know. I think a part of me has always been doing it, no matter what the animal is. If there's been a uh, one that needed saving or rescuing or at home, I've just always taken something in. Doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it doesn't have eight legs and isn't under my pillow unexpectedly I just kind of you wouldn't rescue a spider is that what you're saying no no I don't think they they have any needing rescue <laughs> now what what's fascinating about the rescue ranch is that in in looking and studying everything that you guys are doing is that you're also educating people about what it is that you that you're doing is is that's to open up hearts and imaginations then Well, that's actually the main part of what we're doing and why we're doing it is because I've kind of worn myself out doing the rescue constant, you know, 
say and neuter message, I feel like to really get down to the fundamental rescue, not just on a dog and cat level, but on an all animals, domestic, wild, exotic level, they all need saving. And it's education. The, the only thing that's going to change things is teaching young kids to take care of their animals and make sure they have the proper habitats and making sure that they're not taking things out of their habitats that already have homes. It's interesting you say that because I, I designed my neighborhood, and it's taken me 17 years to do this, to do everything to protect the animals around us, and that was to convince even the neighbors to to, to not have decks on the back of their house, but to have animal sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's been fascinating to watch the animals return, all the way down to a box turtle. Yes. How, how does that affect you in the way that when, when, when it comes to the Carolinas, they basically it's, it's I, I gotta be honest, I gotta cross a line here, that it's almost like you're more of an angel of the Carolinas, too. Well, I, I don't think I would say angel of Carolina. I would say that it's something that's all over the world. It's just proper animal care and respect for what's in your environment and around you. And just understanding that, yes, that baby fawn is adorable and you'd love to cuddle with it, but it has a mama and it has a home. And sometimes you just need to let those things there and observe it instead of taking it in and, and trying to make it your own. Certain animals don't belong um, in the house or as good pets. They they have a home already. It's it's fascinating to drive through my neighborhood, and we, we do. We have 18 head of deer in, in the neighborhood, and the, and the babies are out there right now. Mm-hmm. And and you're right about that, where people, they, they do want to, oh, I just got to go up and touch it. No, you do not. Do not touch that animal. Let them be where they need to be. How do you help educate people to understand that they are not pets? Oh, well, we do have some animals here at Rescue Ranch, um, some exotics and, and domestic animals that we give the kids hands-on interaction and experience with. We have four snakes. Some people come in here terrified of snakes, and by the end of our programs, they're handling the snakes. Um, we just teach them, you know, what they need for their environment, what makes them a good pet, what does not make them a good pet, where are they naturally found, um, and just different ways that they can go and help, you know, not in a way save the environment, but make the environment more animal friendly instead of, you know, polluting it and teaching them about recycling. It's kind of all all cycles around from the wildlife and what you do outside to how you take care of pets in your own home. So we try and develop programs and have curriculums that are teaching them about these things at the same time they're having fun handling these animals. And even if it's feeding a goat, we're trying to educate them something and teach them about it. I'm, I'm Native American. I study Native American spirituality. You really come across to me as somebody who believes that animals do speak to us. Are, are we on the same page when, when I say that? In other words, Ted Andrews has written a book called Animal Speak because animals do speak. Do, do you believe in that theory, too? Absolutely. I think that um, just noticing some of their behaviors, they don't actually come right out and speak the same language, but they do have ways of communicating and understanding those behaviors makes you better at dealing with animals. I mean, our birds, we try and teach the kids. We don't let the kids handle the birds because they do bite and they're unpredictable, Um, but they can learn about them while they're sitting there and they can watch the signs and see the signs that the birds are uncomfortable or if they're happy in their situations. It's it's just having a respect for animals and nature and everything in it. And I think sometimes this day and age, people have gotten away from that and just kind of get the mentality that they can do whatever they want and there's no repercussions. But the long-term thing is, is the whole reason we have pet overpopulation is because people have done this without repercussions and now we're dealing with an issue. And, and, you know, it's that issue that I helped with the with the Humane Society create their new campaign, which was yeah, because I've because I've rescued so many dogs and and it is that, that there's no such thing as a pet condom. And, and that and that has been our main drive. And they and more people are going to have their dogs spayed and neutered because it's it's being that reality. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, we still have these darn, you know, puppy farms and things and puppy mills. And, and, it, and there was one that was recently busted here in the Carolinas where they had over 80 dogs and it's like mm-hmm. I how do we educate people that that these this is not a business and that that even though it may be nice that that you are trying to make it a business something's going to happen along the line where those animals are going to suffer greatly well it is a business it's a business of saving lives so you need to educate 
some of the humane groups and, and your rescue groups to market themselves as a business and run things as a business because that is what the puppy mills are doing. And their biggest competitors are puppy mills. So if they start marketing against the puppy mills and using their rescued blends, then promote it the right way and, and market against the puppy mills because the only way is to shut them down is if they're not making any money. Yeah, because it's amazing how many people, when it comes to rescuing dogs and cats, they all think, oh, I don't want to go pay that money. I, I went over to PetSmart and it was like, oh. And it's like, man, it's, it's more than just running into a, a box store and taking home a dog. Right. How? Right, and and people will pay. People will pay a thousand, two thousand dollars for a dog, and and they don't want to get a bargain basement deal. And sometimes when you have you know free cats or things like that, that's you're you're devaluing that animal. So we need to change the mentality and teach people that these are animals that need to be invested in. They need to be cared for. They need to have vet care. That this is a serious thing, not something that you can go buy, you know, in Walmart and not, you know not know where it's really coming from. I have a, a paraplegic uh, Chinese crested. And, and mm-hmm. you know, and when people are going, no, why would you do that? Why? Because it's an animal. It's a living, breathing thing. He doesn't know that, that he's paralyzed. Right. But the thing is, is you're right, though. You've got to invest the time. and, and But the love they give back to you is just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, when and it's not just dogs and cats. I mean, you can see it with our animals here at the ranch. They all have their own personalities, even our snakes. Um, and, you know, they have their own quirks, and it's fun to learn those things. They have certain people that they like, and you can tell when they don't like others. It's, it's just very interesting to live your life around animals, and I'm happy that I can teach this to my children, and I hope other people want to teach it to their kids so they grow up with a different compassion and a better respect for animals. Now, you've got 87 acres in the Statesville area. Is this open to the public, or how, how do people find out more about you? Um, there's a lot of information on our website, so rescueranch.com. Uh, we are open to the public Monday through Friday, uh, 9 a.m. to 4. We do close for special events. Um, right now we have our critter camps, which are going on. Uh, it's our big first week of critter camp where we have kids coming in and having hands-on experiences with the animals. We have a vet group that's coming in a, a week or two, and they're going to make it a mock clinic inside our education building. So we give people a tour of our building, um, kind of show them the lay of the land. They get to meet our animals and and learn a little bit about what we are doing here. But our biggest thing right now is getting the school groups in, doing field trips, having our critter camps. Um, in October, we have a huge fall festival, which is an open house. We do a food truck competition, a mud run. Um, so we're doing a lot of different events here. And although we don't have dogs and cats for adoption at our building here, we do work with a lot of different groups in the area that are already doing that. So we invite them to come in and have their adoptable pets Um showcased here. What, what's so fascinating is that when you said that you've got the veterinarians coming in, now, is is that to educate the public, the veterinarians, as to what they do? Um, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of kids that grow up and say, I want to be a veterinarian. Well, what does that entail? And we'd love to show these kids this is exactly what it's like to be a veterinarian and if this is your passion, you know, this is what you need to do to pursue that. And a lot of kids, you know, might like that and some kids might not like that but it's it's a way of just showing them what vets do it's not just you know taking in the animals and giving them a shot sometimes they're stitching up sometimes there's euthanasia it just depends so um, we work with vca hospitals and they're coming in and and they have their vets volunteering their time to show these kids what they do go through on a daily basis i love i love that you that you're talking about what vets do because there's a lot of people that dump their dogs or their animals alongside the road because they they feel that the vet's just trying to rip them off and that that is the absolute farthest thing from the truth well, I think there's some, it's like any walk of life. You have some people that might actually be doing that, and then some people that aren't, and they're just trying to make a living like everybody else. So it's finding the right vet that you're comfortable with, but there are lower cost options available. But people just really need to understand what taking care of a pet means and what that responsibility is. And sometimes it means you have to do whatever it can because your pet needs medical care. Now, you've got something that's pretty cool that's coming up. You've, you've listed the different events and things that are coming to the the Rescue Ranch, which is a 24-7 emergency vet clinic. You've got a boarding facility on the way, a, a dog park. There's so much going on. Is this a, is this a non-profit to where people, because on iHeartRadio, we're, we're everywhere around the world. So is this something that people can donate to you, or is this, how, how, about, how are you guys raising funds knowing how expensive it is? 
Um, yeah, donations are greatly appreciated. We have an Amazon wish list, so even if people didn't want to donate dollars, they could go on and see what our items are. Um, but for the most part, it's it's we run on donations. Our events are, are selling tickets to our events, having people come to our events and, and buying a T-shirt or a hat and just different things throughout the year that we try and market and plan on. And it's no different than any other nonprofit where, you know, we do whatever we have to do to support one another. I'm very big on being a resource. Um, you know, the boarding facility and the adoption center that we have on our plans, I'm hoping I won't have to build. I'm hoping that we can support all these other groups in the area that are already doing it and have these animals in foster care. Through our programs, I hope they can adopt these animals out and we can change things where it won't be necessary because our community is already doing these great things. Summertime is the best time where people hit the back roads of Carolina. And once you do that, you begin to see that there are animals that aren't being taken care of back there. Do they get in touch with you or is it something that they, because I'm sure the law enforcement doesn't want to hear about that somebody's horse is not doing well. Well, no, actually they do. I mean, animal control, that's what they should be doing. Animal control gets a bad rap because they are the ones that people dump their dogs on, but they don't want to have to be the dog catcher, so to speak. Their job is to go out and police animal cruelty and, and to look at those things. They they are trying to turn things around, especially in uh, Iredell County where we are, to get these animals out so they can go out and take care of cruelty cases or puppy mill raids, things like that, which is what they're supposed to be doing. But a lot of times they get dumped on and, and they only have so much funding, so they end up being the dog catchers. But animal control is who you call when you have an issue or you think a pet is being neglected or um, mistreated. And and, and they do come out and investigate. What about that rumor, though, that, that in order to prove that an animal is being mistreated, it takes longer and a lot of people don't want to participate with that? that that's got to be like a, a wives' tale. Well, it'll take a lot longer if you don't do anything about it. I love your attitude. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> you know, uh, you confront the people. You tell them you're unhappy. Take pictures. Uh, animal control is one of the biggest things that they say. You know, document it. Take pictures what you see. And um, they, they do. They are putting their foot down these days. They're getting a lot better when when they can be. But that proof is the biggest thing. So get your cameras out. Everybody's traveling with a cell phone or an iPad or something these days that has a camera on it. There's no reason you can't take a picture and, and have documentation of it. Summertime in the Carolinas. You're in the Statesville area. What part? Are you up there by 40 or are you down by 77 area? We're actually um, just north of 40 and 77's interchange. So um, we're one mile north of 40. So really an hour and a half from, from really anywhere. I mean, if, you, if you're coming from the mountains or if you're coming from Winston-Salem or even Charlotte, you're so easily accessible. Oh, absolutely. And we're only a mile, mile and a half off the highway. So it's, it's fairly easy to get to us. And um, hopefully at some point we'll have our horse trails open and we'll, people will be able to trail their horses out here and spend a day, have a picnic and enjoy the beautiful countryside. I'm so proud of you. I, oh, this this is just you. unbelievable. And when I found out that this is what you guys were doing and stuff, it was like, oh my God, we got to get you on iHeartRadio. And, and help share the message of what it is that you've dedicated your life to. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's rewarding. Like I said, with Critter Camp being in here, just seeing the kids having fun, interacting with the animals, and asking them at the end of every day what they've learned. And it's nice to hear their feedback. So one more time, how can people find out more about you? Uh, everything is, is done online, rescueranch.com. And then um, we've got Susan and Terry in the office, and we can keep you informed and, and get you some on our e-blast. <laughs> How are you? Doing very well. Man, I, 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 I've, I've been going through your book, the, the cookbook, for about two weeks now because it's, it's almost like that, that movie where uh, the, the woman wanted to try Julia Child stuff. And I'm testing out all your recipes. You've got something going on here, girl. Well, I'm a foodie and I like to eat. So when you like to eat, you want to make it amazing at home. A chef once said to me that cooking is the art that time allows to disappear. And then when you are preparing dinner, and stuff, it's almost like you have to relinquish the control of the beauty of the art. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm kind of a control freak. It's hard for me to let go of anything, but I think that when you, you do something that's a labor of love, you know, and you want everybody to enjoy what you do in the kitchen, it's special. And I think that, you know, food is also about presentation. So I do think, you know, the beauty of that is that you're, it does disappear, thank goodness. 
Do you, do you find yourself working with other companies like Nordstrom's or Belk and stuff like that? Because your presentation inside the book is unbelievable. It's almost like for Christmas and Thanksgiving, you're, you're really going to redesign some things for people around the country. Uh, well, no, you know what? I just, I think that for me, it's important. Like I love, I collect dishes also. Like I love setting a great table. And I think that there's an art to that as well. You know, so you make great food and make it really special and, and people really enjoy sitting down and spending some time at the dinner table instead of just gobbling it up and, you know, getting the hell out of there. <laughs> When, when you say you're talking about dishes and stuff, here in the South, we go what's called junking. We hit all the flea, flea markets and stuff. Do you find yourself going into kind of secret dark places to look for those special collections? Oh, yeah. That's really fun. We have something here at the Rose Bowl. It's called, you know, just like a swap meet or, you know, whatever. You know, that everyone calls it something different, but it's the same concept. But I'll go to different places and find some of the most amazing little treasures that, you know, nobody really knows the value of, I think. Courtney loves to do that, too. She loves, there's a couple of little places around our house that um, are a really cute little out of the, you know, out of the way places, and she, she shows me all her secrets. Do you think your love for cooking and presentation is because of your mother and your sister? It, it's almost like you, you set the, the uh, like a song, set it free when you would cook when you were younger. Oh, that's, that's, I think it's definitely, that's definitely true. And also my grandmother used to show me how to really put a meal together. Because it is a dance. I mean, when you cook a big meal for your family, especially like if it's Thanksgiving or you're doing a good barbecue, whatever it may be, and there's a lot of different dishes, everything, for me anyway, I like everything to come out at the same time and, and hot. You know, so it's just about timing and, and, and it's the way you move around the kitchen. And, the, you know, when I'm in there cooking and I'm doing a lot of dishes at the same time, it's like, watch out. Jeez. It's, just, it's like an orchestra, you know, and everybody just moves it out of the way. But once it comes out and it smells so amazing and it looks so pretty, it's, it's just a really great feeling of satisfaction to be able to create a meal for the people that you love. See, and, and then on top of it. And, and the pictures the pictures that you show inside your book are, are exactly that. It makes you want to be creative. And you, you've actually held out an invitation for us to kind of grow with you. Oh, that's sweet. Well, you know, what's funny is we had a food stylist, you know, with, with the book in the beginning. And she was great, but it wasn't exactly the way that I wanted the dish to look, you know, because it was somebody else's interpretation. So I redid, like I took the pictures all over again after I made the dishes because they had to look exactly like how I do it. So I had a, I had a really good time doing that, those, those photos. I was, I was going to ask you about what kind of cream of wheat that you created, but you know what? After talking about the presentation and stuff, more love seems to be in that presentation. Is that what it was? Was that your secret? I think so. I mean, I just really um, am passionate about it. You know, and I think that I just, it, it's not, it's just something that goes along with what you're doing. And if you do something, anything in life that you're really passionate about, you know, it really does make a difference. If you're doing something that's, a, you know, that's, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to, you know, it's not going to ever be the same. I really look forward to cooking because it's something that really relaxes me and I go into a zone. Collecting cookbooks. Who's your Beatles when it comes to uh, cookbooks? Who's the one that makes you just go, oh, wow? Um, I find, honestly, that when I go to a place that's special, like this last summer, I went to the Hotel du Cap in the south of France and I'd always wanted to go there my entire life. That was on my bucket list. And they had cookbooks. And I was like, oh, my God, and the pictures are so beautiful. And when I go to some place like that in, a, in another country or a fabulous um, hotel or restaurant, you know, that has a cookbook, I know that um, Valentino has a book coming out, or it might be out right now, but it's coming out for the holidays, and it's all about table setting. And I honestly cannot wait for that book to come out because it's something I've really looked forward to. So, you know, books like that where you can really get inspiration and do something a little bit different. And then I love 
cookbooks at Williams Sonoma. Like I love just to go there and look at the cookbooks and see what's going on there. And I love um, Rocco Despirito has great cookbooks. But, you know, just different, different uh, chefs that I admire. This is like a new television show waiting to be born. Just where we travel around with you and live vicariously through your passion for food. Oh uh, well, it's it's definitely. Um, something that I enjoy and that I'm blessed enough to be able to experience. So, you know, and I've created like a lot of dishes over the years. I've been cooking for decades and for my kids. And over the years, the kids start to find their favorite, you know. And so that's what I did in this, in this particular book. I took a compilation of all of my kids' favorite things and things that are easy to cook for the family. Just real simple but just the favorites and put them together in a book so that everybody could enjoy. Well, the pictures, the presentations, everything in your book has got to be as delicious as those brownies are. And I I can't thank you enough for releasing this book, especially this time of year as we get into a a foodie's paradise with Thanksgiving and everything coming up. Yeah, it's really fun. I think one of my favorite things at this time of the year is the uh, sweet potato souffle. And if you haven't made that, you should because it is so good.